This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 31st, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we don't believe Doug Massey and other candidates who are advocating leftover PFDs are serious fiscal conservatives. Second, we explain where we believe the K-12 through debate goes off track, as well as the question that helps it get back on track. And third, we explain why we are concerned when we hear some describing the CONCON vote as a referendum on the PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Number one, and you got some good topics today. I really want to get into it. So first, we're going to talk about serious fiscal conservatives. There are some out there, and there are some who are not so serious about uh, being fiscal conservatives, If especially those that are opening up a big piggy bank. Let's talk about that. So I want to focus on Doug Massey, because Doug Massey is making this case. He's running against Shower for the, for the Senate seat up in the Valley. Massey's making the case that he's a strong fiscal conservative because he you know, favors reining in spending and, um, and, and uh, uh, a spending cap. And, and that's going, that's going to solve, all, solve our problems. Here's the problem with that. Uh, we're not going to get a spending cap. I mean, I, unless, unless the constitutional convention passes, we're not going to get a spending cap. Um, and even with, even if the constitutional convention passes, I'm not sure we're going to get a spending cap. What really, so what really matters is not so much what you say you are, but, but the positions you take. And the problem with Massey and the problem with others who are running around saying, I'm a strong fiscal conservative because I believe in reigning in spending. They're not, they're not walking the talk. Um, if, you, if you say that I'm for a reasonable PFD, which is exactly what Doug Massey is saying and exactly what Will Staff and others uh, on the Republican side are saying, I'm a fiscal conservative, I'm gonna rein in spending, but I'm for a reasonable PFD. What a reasonable PFD means is you're for opening the, up the PFD to use it to fund government just a little bit maybe. But the problem is it will never be a little bit. Let's go back to 2012 um, and the CBR and the SBR. We have a, we have a budget problem. We have, these, we have these savings accounts and people say, okay, we're just gonna use the savings accounts to get us over one year and then we're gonna rein in spending. Or we're gonna use the, we're gonna use the, the, the budget accounts. Uh, we're gonna use the savings accounts for a couple of years while oil prices are down and then, you know, all prices will pop back up and all will be good again. The problem is over the entire decade, we kept draining those savings down. Things never got better. We never reined in spending. Oil prices never came back to the point that, that they could, that they were sufficient to balance the budget on their own. Right. And the, and the, and the, and the spending accounts kept going down and down and down and down. CBR is, or SBR is effectively gone. And the CBR is near gone uh, now uh, over the, over that, over the course of the decade. It structure matters. You can't be a fiscal conservative unless you also believe in structure, unless you also believe in budget structure in a way that effectively stops savings. And if you crack open the PFD, the PFD is roughly what another one point nine billion dollars, and we've already cracked into it uh, by 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 quite a bit, three hundred million dollars this fiscal year, a lot more in prior fiscal years. As you crack into it, you're just you, you, you. There's not a stopping point once you go down that road, and so you're just adding more and more revenue by allowing the PFD to be the 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 leftover, allowing it to be the reasonable amount left over after you've spent on everything else. 
you're just allowing the 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 the, the spending to go on and on and on. That's not a fiscal conservative. <laughs> a fiscal conservative believes in structure, believes in fiscal structures that prevent additional spending. Hammond, Hammond was a fiscal conservative. He believed in using an income tax as a structure, as and having it as a sort of Damocles over the legislature's head. You want more spending, right. then right. you got to raise it. Then you got to raise it through an income tax. And his belief was that the legislature would never do that because uh, the 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 pushback or the the, the consequence of voting for uh, uh, an income tax would be would be too much. It's it, if we cut into the PFD as we we've already cut into the PFD, but if we elect people who say conservatives, especially if we elect so-called conservatives who say I'm for a reasonable PFD, you're just continuing to open that door on and on and on. The next time we'll have this conversation about a stopping point is roughly 2030, 2031, 2032, when the PFD is all gone, when the reasonable PFD um, is down to zero. Now, I know that Doug Massey and I know that Will Staff and I know that others will say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to stop it before it gets there. I'm going to, right. well, well, I heard the same people say that back in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. I can go through the entire decade and I can probably give you names from memory of, of the people who were saying it. Right. But it's just you, you've got to be, to be a strong fiscal conservative, to be a, a true fiscal conservative. You've got to believe putting in place structures that prevent the spending. And I know people will say, well, I believe in the spending cap, so that's a structure. Well, you've got to believe in realistic structures <laughs> that, that, that stop spending. You can't, you can't buy yourself off like Will Staff's trying to do up in, up in Fairbanks. You can't buy yourself into redemption by saying, well, I believe in structures that aren't going to happen. I mean, I, I, believe right. in things, I, I believe in things stopping points. Uh, that will that will never be uh, enacted. You've got well, this, you've got you've got to have you got to have stopping points that that are realistic. Well, and I think again that is again we're seeing that in certain candidates, uh, Massey and staff come to mind for sure because they are so vacillating on the PFD and saying, well, a PFD we can afford or a sustainable PFD or which all translates to we're going to spend that money uh, no matter what. Uh, because we believe it's better for government than anything else. And that's the difference between a true a fiscal conservative and kind of that lukewarm um, conservative when it's uh, when it comes to fiscal matters. Yeah, I don't I don't even I, I truly don't even think I mean, there's no difference on this issue between Doug Massey um, uh, and 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 uh, Les Guerra and uh, uh, other Democrats. Uh, there's no, there's no different, and, and Kathy Giesel, there's just no difference between he and him and the Democrats on this issue. They're all saying reasonable PFD. Now, now Massey will tell you, or, or Steph will tell you, tell you, yeah, but my definition of a reasonable PFD is bigger than their, it's not, it's not. Once right. you get the lobbyists down there, once you get the, the Juno process going, people will push that spending envelope more. And we saw it in the 2010s. I mean, I, there, there is no better example. I don't have to go to another state. I don't have to go to another time period. All I have to do is look at the last decade and see what happens. It's for the children or it's we need these roads or we need this port or we need we need a strong university or we need this or we need that or we need something else. And, and there's always a game and there's always a reason and there's always a push. And if the money's there, particularly if the top 20% don't have to pay for it, particularly if you're using, if your PFD cuts, if the money's there, there's not going to be a stopping point. Right. right. So, so you've got, so you don't have, you, you, you can't, I mean, Doug Massey legitimately can't claim, can't legitimately claim to be a fiscal conservative when his position is exactly the same as, as Matt Clayman's, uh, Les Garris, anybody else's. I mean, it's just, th there is no stopping point. And, and, and you've got to, if you don't have a campaign, if your campaign is platform is not set on a structure, a realistic structure that stops revenues, stops spending like taxes or like, or like, you know, a, a constitutionalized PFD or just no, no cuts to the PFD. If it's not set on some sort of structure, then, then you're not really a fiscal conservative. You're just a, you're, you know. I have a friend uh, uh, in, in my business career who used to talk about round heels and what he meant by that 
were, were business people who would always just sort of rock back and say, okay, well, you can spend that little bit more and spend that little bit more. Yeah. And, and, and by the, and by the time you got to the, to the end of the day, but <laughs> by, by the time you got to the end of the P and L yet, you were in a loss. You had, you had red. Right. Showing up. How did that, how did that happen? I mean, where did that come? I mean, Whoa, how did we get here? Exactly. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets is our guest. Uh, we're talking about uh, the weekly top three. This is number one, true social conservatives. Um, Brad. Uh, fiscal. That, fiscal. True, I'm fiscal sorry, conservatives. true fiscal conservatives. I'm sorry. Brad, does that about wrap that for this one? I mean, we, this is this is the yardstick we should be looking at people over. And this is why we ask the question about the PFD every time. You know, do you support the full statutory formula instead of um, sustainable or reasonable or, you know, partial or whatever in other words that they're going to use? Anything else, Brad, final thoughts on this one? Well, I'll give it to Dunleavy. I mean, I, I, Dunleavy believes in the structure. It's a 50-50 PFD. It's a cut of about $800 million from the statutory PFD averaged over the next de decade. But at least he believes in the structure, a structure, a 50-50 PFD, cutting it off at a 50-50 at a uh, PFD. I, you can't, I, I can't find where Doug Massey and, and the others uh, are talking about any sort of cutoff. It's just it, we're going to see one experience of round heels after another until just like in the in, in the last decade uh, when the CBR and the SBR disappeared, we're going to see it uh, in this decade as the PFD disappears. So don't don't believe, you know, these self-serving claims that I'm a fiscal conservative if they don't have a realistic structure in place uh, to deal with it. David says Massey said this was a very sore subject for him. He gave a hot response on his op-ed to Carol Carmen's article last month. Yeah, he's very sensitive to it because he knows it is the Achilles heel of his entire campaign pitch. He knows it is. That's why they never responded to this program. I reached out to them two or three times. I actually spoke to somebody after I complained about not getting a response. Somebody from his campaign emailed me and said, which email did you send it to? And I listed the emails that I sent it to. And they said, thanks, we'll get back to you. Crickets. I mean, just not, he doesn't want to come on and ask those questions. He doesn't want to answer those questions at all. Um, David said reasonable PFD. Yeah. I mean, that's the new, that's the new thing is the reasonable PFD. Um, exactly. You know, some of these we're probably just going to be stuck with. I mean, the Will Stapp thing, it's probably going to happen. Now the question is, does he get subsumed by the pod people once he gets down there? The Kathy Geisels, John Coghills. Uh, you know, Bryce Edgman's and 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 Bert Stedman's of the world, or does he stand strong uh, for his constituency? Mm, I don't know. It remains to be seen. I guess we'll put it that way, Brad. Well, that's he's a Steve Thompson successor, right? I mean, so Steve that's Thompson. a hard district anyway. I mean, that that's what that district is. That district is producing Steve Thompson's and Bart Lebon's. That's what it's producing. Yeah, it's a. I mean, it's a it's a, a top twenty percent district. It's it's sort of like the district that. Uh, that uh, that Geisel's in, um, you know, they they it's it's the one that produces people who say don't tax me to pay a PFD, when in fact that's not that's not what's going on. We had a whole segment on that last week, but it's it's a top twenty percent district that you know, their priority is avoid their priority is avoiding paying for government, even if government grows, even if the consequence is government grows, as long as they don't have to pay for it, they're fine with it. Um, it. They would like to be able to direct to direct the spending, the government growth in the direction that they like. Uh, I think Will's deal is infrastructure, but it's but but that's the that's that's where that segment sets. Don't right. don't make me pay for it. You can spend whatever you want. <laughs> Just don't make me pay for it. And as long as right. you don't make me pay for it, go at it. Yeah, uh, exactly. So I mean, that was Steve, and it, to some degree, it's Bart. So. Yeah, no, but I mean that's again that's the difficulty because that's what that district produces. The districts are are very much kind of a purplish color. They're a deep red plum. That's what they are right there. But here's the deal. Let's not turn a valley district, a valley district into that. Let's not yeah. let's not replace Shower who is a strong is a strong fiscal conservative with somebody like Massey. That's exactly it. Uh, you know, th this is what we're going to get in these districts. And if we can incrementally bring it back more towards a true sound fiscal conservative, we'll do well. Um, and I think Will is young enough that maybe he can, you know, be, be persuaded in that regard. Go ahead well, quickly. 
Well, well, let's just not lose any more. I mean, let's not, let's not Steve Thompson's district. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, let's just not lose. Let's not lose showers district. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Brad, number two uh, on the list of today is, of course, the K-12 funding debate. We know that's been a big campaign issue. It's my pet peeve, the whole BSA BS um, and everything else. Uh, but where does it go off track? Give us a teaser here before we take a break. I had an, I had an extended exchange with a, with a big proponent of, uh, of K-12, through increasing K-12 through spending, increasing uh, the BSA. And there was one part of that discussion that uh, that really highlighted to me where this whole issue comes down. Uh, it, it's a to some degree, it's they would put it as a matter of priority. Uh, to me, uh, it's again a matter of structure. So I, I think I think it helps identify. I, I think it helps sort of make clear uh, what the uh, what the K K through twelve uh, debate uh, is is becoming about. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're into the number two slot for the weekly top three. And that, of course, is where this uh, whole K through 12 funding debate goes completely off the rails. Brad was having a conversation with somebody about this, and uh, he wanted to discuss it this morning on the weekly top three. Brad, go ahead. So so in this conversation, the person said, you know, we need to expand K through 12 spending and, and we need to expand the BSA and we need to do all sorts of other bells and whistles. My response to that when I get into a conversation like that is, okay, who pays? Uh, because sometimes it will sober people up and then, oh, we have to pay for it? Oh my God. Well, yeah, who is going to pay? And and when they say, well, we'll just have to cut the PFD a little bit further. Okay, so you want lower and middle income Alaska families to pay for increased K through 12 spending and let the, the top 20% to get off scot-free. Do they not go to schools? Do they not share in the benefits? I mean, a, a lot of top 20% businessmen tell us that uh, that expanding K through or increasing K through 12 spending is important. So it must be important to them, but you don't want them to pay for it. Well, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I you know, want some I guess I want you know, something else to pay. I don't know what, but we must have increased BSA. And, and here was the here was the point we finally got to. Um, I went through all the other do you want oil companies increase. I mean, two years ago, Alaskans turned that down 58 to, to 42. So that's not going to happen. Uh, do you want an income tax? Look, people say that uh, an income tax isn't going to happen. Sales tax isn't going to happen. So who's going to pay for, for this? Well, the, the response is whatever it takes, whatever it takes. It's a, it's a priority and whatever it takes. If it takes PFD cuts, if it takes all, whatever it takes, we, we, need, to, we need to spend on it. The, the, and that to me is the core of the problem. What we don't, we don't have, we don't have people who took accounting courses. <laughs> out there in the world. We don't have people who understand that when you add something to the left-hand column, you've got to add something to the right-hand column. When you add right. something to the spending right. column, you got to add something to the to the to the revenue column. And 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 what you add to the revenue column makes a huge world of difference. If you add it by by additional PFD cuts, then you're taking it out of middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20% are are, are skating by. If you Say you're going to take it out of oil companies like Les Garrett does. It's not true. I mean, look at the look at the vote that we had um, uh, two years ago in in Proposition One. If you say you're going to take it out of uh, out of income taxes, you know, show me where the where the support's going to be uh, for that. So it's the the whatever it takes crap uh, is is the problem. They're, they 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 just live in the left hand column. They just live in the spending column. And just completely ignore the the right hand column as if it you know as if it doesn't matter doesn't exist has no real world consequences nobody has to lose money uh, just you know fairies are going to come up with the additional money to, to to pay for what they whatever they want in these conversations that we have with people it's important to talk about the left hand and the the left hand column and the right hand column at the same time with equal importance. Yeah. And, and, and it begins to sober people up, I think, when you when you have that conversation and, and say, who's going to pay? I mean, in this case, in case, this case, a big part of the pitch for K through 12 increased K through 12 spending was, well, it's important to, you know, it's important to get kids ready for jobs and it's important to get kids ready for uh, the community. It's important to, you know, to 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 develop them educationally, develop them mentally, develop them uh, uh uh, behaviorally, 
uh, to, to have that additional school. Okay, so you want to make their lives better by making their parents and their family life worse by taking money out of middle and lower income. All these kids you want to help. You right. want you want them to pay for it. You well, want, and you're, you want the top twenty top twenty percent to skate, and not yeah. just the, not just the not just the adults. The children are all being taxed. Every one of those children are being taxed at a tremendous rate with the PFD taking. That's something we all forget. Yeah, and 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 so it's I, by the end of the conversation, we were sort of getting toward the same place which is, well, yeah, and I need to think about who pays at the same time as I think about how much. But it, it, but it, the, the, the whatever it takes mentality is, is, what's really, is, is what's really causing the problem here. People are not looking at the right-hand column uh, when, uh, when they talk about these things. And that's, I mean, that's where you get, that's where you get the rolling heel or the, the, the round heels, right? Uh, that's where you get people saying, well, yeah, you're right. You got to spend it on this because you know the business people the 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 chamber of commerce says we need you know we need need more k through 12 spending we need to bolster the school so okay well i guess i got to do that who's going to pay for it right and 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 well i don't want i don't want middle and lower income alaska families to suffer well boy you know i've got i've got to sort of mesh these two together if they don't think about the right hand column if they just ignore the right hand column they never mesh the two together. They have round heels and we just keep spending and spending and spending. So when you have these, kind, I guess my, I guess my response or I guess my, my plea here is when you have these conversations with people on air, or when you have these conversations with people in your life, ask the question, who pays? Great. Yeah. You want to spend more yeah. terrific. Who pays? And, well, and, and, and tell me why it's fair that, that you're, tar tell me why it's realistic what you're saying and tell me why it's fair you're targeting that group. Well, and and again, you're again saying, assuming that, okay, you want to spend more, that's great. My question is, and I agree with you, I agree with it, that the who pays should always be part of the argument. But the question should be, do we need to spend more on education? We're already spending three times what most people are spending on education, and we're getting the worst results ever. I mean, there's a whole argument here about what we're spending on education to begin with. I don't, I don't disagree with that at all, Michael, but it has to be all Alaskans that are engaged in that conversation. And right now we've got a fiscal structure that enables the top 20% to avoid yeah. that, that conversation. Yeah. They don't, they don't have to be part of it because they're not paying using PFD cuts. They're not paying. So to me, we need, we need to get who pays right. We need, we need to get a, a function that says all Alaskans pay. And then, and then it's going to be magical. I mean, to some degree, you're even going to hear Natasha push back and say, well, wait, I don't want to spend on that. I mean, if you're going to take money out of my pocket, <laughs> I don't want to spend on that. Or Giesel, if, if you're, I don't want to, I don't want to pay for that out of my pocket. You know, as long as I can push it down to middle and lower income Alaska families, it's fine. Yeah, we need to do that. But, right. but if I have to pay for it, it's something else. Uh, it, it's my, I and my constituents who vote for me or who may not vote for me. Um, if they have to pay for it, uh, uh, that's something else entirely. So you're, you're absolutely right. We need to have the discussion of whether we ought to be paying for it. But until we can, until every Alaska family is engaged in that discussion, until the top 20% have a stake in pushing back in that conversation and are part of that conversation, frankly, the other 80% is going to lose. Yeah. Be because, the, because the top 20% is the donor class. They're the ones that that you know are going to are going to be the 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 ones that actually you know cause the conversation to to push back. So yeah, you're absolutely right. We need to talk about whether there's additional paying, but but we need to get everybody engaged in that well, conversation before and, we're going to have success. And this applies not just to education. Any program, any project, any pet thing, it should always be who pays. That should be the first question. Okay, great. Who pays? That that's a I think that's a fantastic yardstick to use. We're down to the last three and a half, four minutes here, uh, Brad. So let's move on to number four, which is if the con con fails, there could be some consequences that we hadn't considered. And I'll be honest, I hadn't considered this until you sent me the list and I was like, hmm. Yeah. So if the con con fails, people could just say, well, see, the people don't care about the PFD because they didn't vote for it. 
There was a shot. Yeah, exactly. There was a Sean Dugan article article in the in the ADN that I was reading, and the, and the article basically was the reason for ConCon. The pe- reason you know people are giving and pushing for ConCon. People say the reason people say are gonna, they're going to vote for ConCon is because of the PFD to get the PFD straightened out. Well, okay. So what happens if the PFD? What what happens if ConCon doesn't win? And the reason that we were supposed to have ConCon, the reason that people were pushing for ConCon was because. Uh, because of the PFD and the and CONCON doesn't win. Will the next Sean Dugan article will be, well, people don't care about the PFD because if they would have cared about the PFD, they would have voted would have for, voted for CONCON. And so it must be that they don't care about PFD. That was next to another to an article also where somebody was talking to Kathy Giesel or interviewing Kathy Giesel. And Kathy was saying, well, you know, the PFD used to be important, but when I go to doors anymore, it's not that important. And so you know, I'm I'm not really believing that the PFD is an issue. I need to I need to be concerned about. I don't believe that's true, uh, but but nevertheless, that's what she's saying. And I think I think we're 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 seeing the beginning of a setup here when people talking about ConCon being all about the PFD. I think we're seeing the beginning of a setup that after if ConCon fails after uh, the election, people are going to be saying, well, PFD is not important. ConCon didn't pass. Um, uh, Giesel got reelected or Giesel got elected. I don't know how the hell you describe that, but Giesel got elected, um, and um, and so yeah, PFD doesn't matter anymore. Let's let's go let's go keep cutting it. Yeah, and I and I think that's definitely the danger that all of a sudden it's like, oh no, we can't, uh, you know, uh, no. I mean the PFD, and I, I, look, Brad, I think she might be right in a way that the PFD issue has been pushed down a little bit for voters' attention because we've got inflation and we've got the budgets and the economy and all those things. And I think that they're just like, oh, they're throwing their hands up sometimes because they can't, they're not seeing the PFT change and they feel a little downtrodden about it. We got a minute here. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not still on their minds. It just means that inflation is edged that thing out because they're facing that daily. Yeah, exactly right. But I, for, for, for me, Michael, I think, you know, I'm not decided how I'm going to vote on ConCon to be, to be quite honest. I think there's pros and there's cons and I haven't finally sorted them all out, uh, all out in my mind. But but if I vote against ConCon, it's not going to be because I don't care about the PFD anymore. I care about the P- PFD just as much now as I did then. There are other reasons to be voting against ConCon other than the PFD. And I don't and I and, and I and I'm concerned about people who are p- pitching the whole thing on the PFD and saying, you know, if you believe in the PFD, you've got to vote for ConCon because I, I just don't I don't think that's right. Just because it, it's it's. I don't know what you would call it. It's 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 not uh, um, man coffee this morning causation. It's not causality, right? It's not correlation is causation. Just because you vote for one or didn't vote for one doesn't mean anything on the other side. It just means there may have been a different priority at the you know in the moment, so to speak, uh, than anything else. That's what we're talking about here. Well, in ConCon, the Constitutional Convention is a very complex issue. There, there's a lot of moving parts in there. There's a lot of reasons to be for it, a lot of reasons to be against it. The PFD isn't the sole issue. It's not like we have on the ballot. Do should we have should we pay the statutory PFD? Now, if we had that, I would agree. That election is about the PFD. Some people are trying to turn the ConCon vote into that because they then want to use the results. If, if ConCon goes down, they then want to use the results to undermine the PFD. I, I, my point is that's not what the ConCon vote is. It's not, it's not a, a synonym for should we pay the statutory PFD? And, right. and, and as I say, I think Sean... Sean's article, I don't think Sean's doing it, but I think Sean's article sort of sets that up. Giesel probably is doing it. Um, and, 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 I, and I think it's, it's, it's a misinter- an intentional misinterpretation of the ConCon vote that people are trying to set up so that they can spin it uh, that way uh, after the election's over. Yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised you're still, I'm surprised you still are undecided on the ConCon. I'll say that. Uh, because, I mean, I was early on, I was against it. But I've come to realize that there's a cost to doing nothing just as much as there's a cost to doing something. Here, here's my concern. My concern is it takes the pressure off resolving the PFD. That 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 we then say, oh, the PFD is going to be resolved in the ConCon. We go two years continuing to talk about the PFD's issues off in the ConCon. We don't have to worry about it now. Then we have the ConCon. Then we, you know, if anything comes out, then we have to vote on it may get voted down because of all the stuff that's been put in it. 
And we're five years down the road and we still haven't focused on the PFD because we've kept putting it off, waiting on the CONCON to resolve it. I um, that's that's sort of my fundamental concern. Are we really going to get anything uh, other than additional delay out of uh, out of the CONCON? Right. Brad, final thoughts here as we come down into this. I mean, you'll be with us on Election Day, but final thoughts for folks who may be going early to the polls. Any exhortations or advice for people who are going into the booths here and trying to make these decisions? Yep. First off, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, don't bullet vote uh, where you've got choices, uh, conservative, uh, a number of conservative uh, choices. Rank those choices. Don't. Uh, bullet vote, or it's going to come back to haunt us, uh, as you were describing in the first segment. Segment second is look for true fiscal conservatives, conservative fiscal conservatives that that believe in fiscal structure as much as they believe uh, structures that allow you to rein in spending, that allow you to hold back revenues as as much as they believe, as much as they say they believe um, in restraining spending. Structure is as important uh, as, uh, as as words. Um, uh, in this case. So especially in the Doug Massey race, don't don't take Doug Massey's claim that he's a fiscal strong fiscal conservative at face value because he's not. When you strip off that veneer and you see what he's doing with the PFD, he's in favor of of opening up a whole nother pot of worms in or pot of, a can uh, of worms in terms of uh, additional revenues. Uh, as much as Les Guerra, as much as Matt Clayman, as much as uh, Zach Field. Right, exactly. Well, again, you want to know about people, just look at who's supporting them. And that'll make uh, that'll make all the difference when it's all said and done. All right, Brad, well, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right, uh, Brad Keith, Lee Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.